Okay, so neurological disorders. All right, so to understand neurological disorders, we need to understand the neurological system and how it works. Um, our neurological system is responsible for the control and coordination of basically everything the body does. Um, our brain is basically the control center um, and it works along with our spinal cord to transmit messages to the rest of the body. Uh, the central nervous system is just that, the brain and the spinal cord. Um, and the brain pretty much serves as the integrating and command center um, along with the spinal cord where the nerve roots lie. Um, the peripheral nervous system that includes our uh, cranial and spinal nerves, and they are responsible for carrying the messages to the rest of the body. We have our somatic nervous system, which is responsible for voluntary movement, um, contraction of skeletal muscles mostly, um, and, you know, our um, intentional movements versus our autonomic nervous system, which we're going to be talking mostly about. Um, <clears throat> and that includes our sympathetic and parathetic parasympathetic nervous system. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, okay, so our nervous system, uh, like uh, we said before, it's in charge of all of our body functions. Um, so there's three main functions that it controls. That's sensory function, which obviously um, is uh, having to do with our five major senses, sight, vision, I mean, of course, vision, hearing, uh, taste, smell, and tactile sensation. Um, so our uh, sensory nerves um, transmit those messages to the brain to be processed. Um, that processing of that um, sensory input is called integration. Um, and then there's motor function, like we already talked about, um, with the autonomic and uh, somatic nervous systems. Now, the autonomic nervous system. Uh, this is uh, the um, part of our nervous system that provides information to the smooth muscle and glands. So, therefore, um, it influences the function of our organs. Autonomic, think automatic. Um, these are things that are happening in the body um, without uh, what you would, uh, we would say, a second thought. It's just occurring um, due to our autonomic nervous system. The autonomic nervous system is divided into your sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems. Um, the sympathetic nervous system is primarily controlled by nerves originating um, in the spine, uh, T1 through um, uh, L3, L4. Those are our uh, nerves responsible for the sympathetic nervous uh, response. So therefore, injury in those areas is going to lead to um, autonomic nervous system dysfunction. Um, and then we have our parasympathetic nervous system, um, which is responsible for that rest and digest um, part, uh, uh, um, you know, functions in the body. So anyway, that is mostly our cranial nerves along, uh, it's most specifically cranial nerves three, seven, nine, and 10. Those four cranial nerves and also um, sacral, um, sacral spinal cord uh, nerves originating in the S spine. Um, here's a picture just showing you what the parasympathetic nervous system does versus the sympathetic. Um, it used to be that they were thought to be inhibitory and excitatory, your uh, sympathetic nervous system being mostly excitatory, parasympathetic nervous system being mostly inhibitory. And I'll talk about that more 
um, with these uh, neurotransmitters. Um, neurotransmitters are chemicals that carry the message from the nerves to the cells. Our electrolytes are also <clears throat> responsible for carrying nerves across the cell, I mean, across the nerve, carrying messages across the nerve, excuse me, um, and uh, also controlling what our cells do when they receive those messages. However, neurotransmitters transmit that message from the tip of the nerve to the target cell. So the cells of the organ, the gland, whatever, the muscle, whatever it's trying to communicate with. Um, major uh, neurotransmitters include acetylcholine. Acetylcholine um, triggers um, muscle contraction. It also plays a role in brain and memory function. Um, so therefore, low levels of uh, acetylcholine um, would uh, be causative of Alzheimer's disease. So Alzheimer's is related to low levels of acetylcholine, therefore affecting brain and memory function. Um, high levels of acetylcholine, like we see in um, uh, Parkinson's, um, it is a cause of increased muscle contraction. Um, there is also something that can happen as a side effect of use of cholinergic um, medications, and that's called um, cholinergic crisis, and that leads to... Um, essentially excessive muscle contraction, but then later, um, just like with uh, hyperkalemia and these other um, electrolyte imbalances, you have this excessive use of muscles, but then it later turns to tire and um, weakness, generalized muscle weakness. Um, so, um, and I'll talk about that more cholinergic crisis later. Dopamine. Dopamine uh, plays a part in memory and learning. It also plays a part in smooth muscle coordination. Um, so acetylcholine uh, works to contract the muscles where dopamine is providing smooth um, coordinated movements. Um, so Parkinson's is a result of low dopamine. Therefore, they have uh, stiff um, muscles, um, poor coordination, um, and all the signs and symptoms of Parkinson's that we'll talk about shortly. Epinephrine, epinephrine and norepinephrine, rather, are uh, neurotransmitters and hormones um, they, because they are secreted from the adrenal gland, um, whereas uh, the rest of these mostly originate in the um, in the brain. Epinephrine is secreted by a gland, thus making it a hormone as well as a neurotransmitter. Um, so secreted by the adrenal glands, epinephrine, um, it, the difference between epinephrine and norepinephrine. Um, epinephrine, also known as adrenaline, is released only in times of extreme stress. Um, uh, is the release of epinephrine is stimulated versus norepinephrine is being released regularly. Um, so uh, nor, uh, epinephrine and norepinephrine basically uh, increase heart rate, um, increase respirations, cardiac muscle contraction, um, lead to vasoconstriction. Thus, epinephrine, release of um, uh, epinephrine constantly due to chronic stress can therefore lead to uh, heart disease, hypertension, etc. Um, and, and the opposite, the reason we administer epinephrine to patients um, is because of its vasoconstriction um, properties, such as um, in cases of anaphylaxis, uh, where patients have uh, or angioedema, where patients have severe swelling, and then with anaphylaxis, that um, generalized vasodilation. Administering epinephrine will cause vasoconstriction, vasoconstriction, 
decreases swelling, right? Because it decreases the flow of fluid and blood to the area. Um, so that will help with angioedema, um, uh, croup, different things like that. Um, and it also uh, will boost our blood pressure for situations like anaphylaxis. Um, epinephrine will also uh, help uh, kind of jumpstart the heart um, and cardiac contraction. So that's why we push it in um, uh, advanced uh, CPR, ACLS, kick. Um, GABA is another neurotransmitter. It is a mood regulator. It's one of those inhibitory um, neurotransmitters in that it stops neurons from becoming overexcited. Therefore, when it is low, we end up with anxiety. Uh, benzodiazepines work to uh, increase the action of uh, GABA. Um, so that is why they reduce anxiety. They increase the uh, function of the GABA, thus inhibiting neurons from becoming overexcited and uh, reducing anxiety. Serotonin is another um, uh, major neurotransmitter. It regulates mood, appetite. Um, it also plays a role in blood clotting and our sleep. And low levels of serotonin, I'm sure you're all aware of by this time, is um, cause of depression. So many antidepressants work uh, to increase the action of serotonin. Um, now, when we talk about um, brain damage and trauma to the brain, different areas of the brain uh, control uh, different aspects of our body function. Um, so the frontal lobe is the largest lobe of the brain, um, and it is responsible for all this here. You see concentrating thinking, behavior, impulse control. Damage to the frontal lobe can lead to uh, major personality disorders, um, impulsive behavior, violent behavior, many criminals, um, uh, when they do uh, 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 analysis of these um, violent uh, criminals and serial killers, a lot of these people end up having a frontal lobe defect. Um, Broca's area um, is also in this area. Um, Broca, if you think a uh, Spanish term for mouth is boca, and it is in charge of speech control. Um, the temporal lobe uh, primarily deals with auditory function, um, as well as some language, um, obviously interpreting language. Um, if we are unable to hear or hear properly, so uh, that's what goes on in the temporal lobe. The parietal lobe is in the middle, and it's um, mostly responsible for sensory function. Um, the occipital lobe is uh, responsible for vision, um, and uh, the parietal lobe is also responsible for spatial perception, body awareness. Um, yeah, so um, being familiar, going back to anatomy and physiology, being familiar with the different areas of the brain and what they do um, will help you in understanding neurological disorders. Also, the cranial nerves. Um, I've highlighted uh, three, seven, nine, and 10 because those are the cranial nerves responsible for uh, autonomic um, nerve function. Um, thus, why uh, stimulation of the vagus nerve, like we talked about in the cardiac chapter, uh, that vasovagal response. Uh, stimulation of the va uh, vagal nerve can uh, lead to bradycardia um, and syncope. So, um, and we encourage patients to stimulate the vagal nerve by bearing down in instances of extreme tachycardia when they're having tachy dysrhythmias. Um, so, again, these four uh, cranial nerves are responsible for the um, 
the autonomic nervous system function along with the spinal nerves. Um, I have also um, included a video on Moodle of the cranial nerve assessment, and you see here the different exams. Um, if you know the different nerve damage, um, then you would, you know, different symptoms are going to become depend on which nerves are damaged. Um, so when we talk about our role as a nurse, um, neurological assessment, uh, Glasgow Coma Scale is uh, very important for you to know as a nurse. The score, like it says here, ranges from 3 to 15. A score of 3 would indicate that the patient is comatose. Um, score uh, uh, less or greater than 13 would be indicative of a mild or minor injury. Um, so when a patient has a head trauma um, or they come in um, and we're doing a neurological workup, you uh, do want to know their GCS or Glasgow Coma Scale. Changes in Glasgow Coma Scale could indicate a decline in neurological function. Um, so uh, like it says here, moderate injury is nine to a score of 9 to 12, less than 8. Um, you need to worry about their ability to protect the airway. So GCS less than eight, you may need to intubate. Less than eight, intubate. Um, so uh, when we look at eye opening response, that's going to be obviously, are their eyes opening and closing? Are they, you know, you don't need to do anything. Um, I, when you come in the room, do they just open their eyes, you know, or... I mean, obviously, anybody who's sleeping, that's one thing. But when we're doing a Glasgow Coma Scale, um, you know, uh, we're looking to see that they're spontaneously opening their eyes. Do I need to call their name out or make a noise to get them to open their eyes? That would be a score of three. Do I need to... Um, uh, provide painful stimulus? Like, do I have to pinch them or do a sternal rub to get them to open their eyes? That would be two. And if I've done all of this and they still don't open their eyes, well, then their score in the eye opening department is only going to be a one. Verbal response, obviously, if they're alert oriented, answering questions appropriately, five, confused, four. Three would be they're using inappropriate words um, uh, like word salad, um, like you've learned about in psych, versus two would be incomprehensible sounds uh, like garbled speech or um, just making noises, but not necessarily um, any real um speech going on there. And then if they're not making any sound, then of course that's a one. Now, motor response. Um, are they able to obey commands? Um, can you lift up your right arm? Can you um, lift up your right leg? Yada, yada. Um, obviously, don't they? you can't ask them to obey, to lift a extremity that's already paralyzed. So be mindful of that. But um, ask them to perform commands that they're able to do. Um, now, if they can't um, obey commands, can they at least identify a, a localized pain? Okay, pain in my right foot. Uh, I My foot hurts. Ow, why are you doing that? Why are you hurting my foot? Um, versus withdrawal from pain. Um, not able to really tell you what's going on, but they can at least, you you pinch them and they move their hand away from you versus these two um, flexion and extension. I'm going to talk about it in a second. This is, we're talking about flexion and extension as far as posturing, what we call posturing. And then obviously if they have no movement, um, then that is not a good sign. So a score of three could indicate even brain death um, if they're not responsive to anything. Um, so when we talk about flexion and extension, this is what we're talking about. We're talking about posturing. Posturing is not a good sign. Um, this is going to occur with a severe neurological damage. 
Um, so if you see a patient posturing like this, either curled in towards the body or curled out, extended out away from the body, um, this is not good. Decorticate is when everything is flexed inward towards the body and cerebit is away from the body, ex uh, extended outwards. Um, the corticate is going to be, sorry, worse than, I mean, um, the corticate is slightly better than the cerebit, but they're both uh, pretty ominous signs. We don't want to hear, we don't want to see either in our patient. As far as radiological testing, uh, I'm pretty sure we're all aware of the uh, CAT scan. Um, now, I put here, um, it's usually performed within 10 minutes um, upon the initial uh, complaint of uh, stroke-like symptoms. However, the national guideline is actually that it is performed and resulted in less than 45 minutes. So every hospital is different. But the idea is if a patient's coming in with stroke-like symptoms or if we are um, observing our patient on the floor who suddenly um, is having stroke-like symptoms, we want to get them to CAT scan immediately um, so that uh, that test can be performed and the results can be read in less than 45 minutes. Um, so. Uh, we want to get them to CAT scan ASAP, and like I said, results less than 45 minutes. Um, so CT can show us structural abnormalities. It could show us cerebral edema, tumors. Um, it could show us hemorrhage, a hemorrhagic stroke, or subdural hematoma, um, those kind of things. It can reveal an infarction, which would be like a ischemic stroke. However, Initially, that is not going to show up. It takes a, a couple days for an infarct to show up. So the initial assessment of a stroke I'll talk about later. Um, if it's ischemic, likely their CAT scan is going to be normal. MRI is much more detailed. It shows, um, it, it can show blood flow through the brain better. Um, and it is used to... Um, uh, make diagnosis of ischemia. Uh, it's used for, you know, many things. The main thing with MRI is knowing that we're using magnets instead of radiation. So because of that, this is a safer option for pregnant women. Um, it also, um, we just like any other MRI, we need to be mindful of any computerized implants. Um, and we need to be mindful of what we bring in the room, what we wear in the room. We cannot be wearing jewelry, um, metal jewelry in the room with the um, MRI, sorry. We cannot be bringing in a metal IV pole. That's why I put this picture here, trying to be funny, he he. Um, if if uh, we bring metal in the room, it's gonna be flying across the room. We're gonna be ducking and dodging, uh, metal objects, um, so we need to be mindful of that. Uh, PET scan is much uh, the most detailed exam and it follows, um, uh, it uh, observes down to a cellular level. So that is typically reserved for um, when we're looking for metastasis um, of uh, cancer. So we'll talk about that more when we get to oncology. Um, with CT, they also perform a CT angiogram um, common of the carotid arteries, and I didn't include that in the slide. EEG. EEG is uh, similar to an EKG, um, but an EEG is looking at the electrical conductivity of the brain. Um, so it is used to diagnose, diagnose uh, seizures, um, also some sleep disorders, um, neurological, other uh, neurological disorders, um, especially when patients initially get worked up for psychiatric disorders, especially adolescents and children, um, but pretty much everyone 
who is getting a, a new psych diagnosis, a lot of times they're going to get a big neurological workup done um, to ensure that this is not a neurological disorder versus a mental, um, you know, a just a psychiatric disorder. They're two different things. Um, so EEG is best performed when the patient is sleep deprived. So when you're working in the hospital, usually they will advise you to wake the patient up in the middle of the night. Um, usually like 2 or 4 a.m., they'll just make you wake the patient up and keep them awake. Um, if they're getting this done on an outpatient basis, then you'll advise them uh, to limit their sleep, um, go to bed really late, or wake up super early. Their hair needs to be clean. Um, having greasy hair, just like having Vaseline on your chest for an EKG, um, having greasy hair uh, will make it difficult for the electrodes to stick. Therefore, we need to wash the patient's hair. That's part of the pre-procedural preparation is washing the hair. Um, also, holding any medications that are going to alter the results like stim CNS stimulants and depression, depressant, excuse me. Um, finally, um, an invasive procedure is the lumbar puncture. Um, this is used to diagnose many um, disorders and rule out um, uh, problems. Um, and it is the most definitive test for testing for meningitis. Um, it is usually performed at the bedside. So because of that, in your books, the intra procedure um, information is important because this is a procedure you will likely be a part of. Um, so just like an epidural, this needle, um, a needle um, and catheter is inserted into the epidural space. Um, so that uh, cerebrospinal fluid can be withdrawn um, and sent to the lab for exam and analysis, sorry. Um, so the uh, patient positioning, they're going to need to be like in a cannonball position or leaned over with exaggerated kyphosis or curvature of the spine. Um, you wanna ensure that the patient is extremely still during the procedure. So we want to let them go to the bathroom, have them void prior to and anything else to prevent movement. Now, our meninges, meninges are uh, protective layers uh, protecting our brain and spinal cord. So therefore, meningitis is going to be inflammation of the meninges. Um, so uh, meningitis can be viral, which is the most common cause. Um, it can be fungal, which is more of an opportunistic infection that attacks um, patients who are immunocompromised, such as those with AIDS, um, or it can be bacterial. Bacterial meningitis is a communicable disease that is reportable to the Department of Health and the CDC. It can be caused by meningococcal bacteria. Uh, pneumococcal bacteria, and also Hib bacteria. So um, this is why we give those three um, vaccines in childhood to prevent this. Risk factors include invasive procedures, such as the lumbar puncture I just told you about. Um, that can leave an opening for bacteria to travel in and get into that cerebral spinal fluid. Um, and uh, infect the um, and inflame the meninges. Open skull fracture, skull fracture in general, opens you up to bacteria traveling in. Um, and then um, obviously being immunocompromised, like I said, and overcrowded living spaces, like we talked about before, college dorms, prisons, homeless shelters. Signs and symptoms are gonna include severe headache, photophobia, um, which is sensitivity to light. They may even have phonophobia, sensitivity to um, sound. Nausea, vomiting, irritability, headache, like I said. Um, the main, uh, one of the uh, hallmark symptoms is nuchal rigidity, stiffness of the neck, 
two tests to be performed are Koenigs and Brzezinski's. I will show you those on the next slide. I have also um, uploaded uh, videos. Uh, actually, no, I didn't. I'm sorry. ATI, if you go to your ebook on ATI, it has some excellent videos of Koenigs and Brzezinski's. I will also upload videos um, to Moodle, um, but pretty sure looking at the pictures, you'll be able to figure it out. Um, if it is bacterial, meningococcal um, in particular, uh, the patient could have a red or petechial um, rash to the trunk. Um, so be on the lookout for that. Koenig sign. Koenig sign, you're going to have the patient lie supine and you as the nurse would uh, bend the leg, right? As you bend this knee to a 90 degree angle, you then try to extend out the leg. A positive Koenig sign is going to result in the patient is going to resist you trying to straighten out their leg at all. It's going to cause um, pain uh, all along the um, spinal cord. It may cause their other leg to come up. They may bend this leg up as you try to extend the leg. Um, and that um, is a positive Koenig sign. Um, again, there is a video of Koenigs and Brzezinski's in ATI, and I will upload one to Moodle. Brzezinski's sign is going to be uh, having the patient lay flat and trying to flex their neck. As you try to um, uh, flex the neck here, um, they're going to likely bring their knees up to the chest to relieve pain. Again, it's going to cause pain. It's going to cause them to um, flex their knees up towards the chest. Um, this is in adults, this is in babies. So that is a positive Brzezinski sign. Um, you need to be aware of those. Um, so management, again, lumbar puncture is that definitive diagnostic exam. Um, when we look at the cerebral spinal fluid, CSF, um, for bacterial, it will be cloudy with elevated WBCs protein. There will also be decreased glucose in the CSF. That is because bacteria loves glucose and everybody needs to eat. So um, the bacteria eats up the glucose, thus causing decreased glucose in the um, CSF. They will also have a positive culture. Unlike viral, viral meningitis, uh, the cerebral spinal fluid will be clear. They may have a slightly elevated WBC and protein, but the glucose is gonna be normal and the culture is gonna be negative. So with them, clear um, with normal glucose and negative gram stain. CT or MRI will be used to identify any increase in intracranial pressure. That's what ICP stands for, and I'll talk about that later. Treatment, um, obviously, if it's bacterial, it's going to be antibiotics, IV antibiotics. Viral is mostly just supportive care, um, treating their symptoms, and it will resolve on its own usually. Uh, droplet precautions. Once we are suspecting meningitis, the patient is going to be placed on droplet precautions. Um, that is to prevent the spread of bacterial um, meningitis. Uh, so with that, um, excuse me, um, if it is bacterial, they need to remain on droplet precautions. If it's viral, we can maintain standard precautions, but we will not take them off droplet precautions unless we have confirmation with a lumbar puncture that this is not bacterial. Once we find out a patient has bacterial meningitis, we need to notify the um, local um, public health department. Um, Again, monitoring for signs and symptoms of increased intracranial pressure. We'll talk about that shortly. Um, and um, again, encouraging vaccines. 
seizures. So what is a seizure? It is an uncontrolled, sudden uncontrolled electrical disturbance in the brain, okay? It can be generalized, affecting the entire brain, or it could be focal, only affecting a, a portion of the, an area, a certain focal point in the brain. Um, either one can cause, uh, uh, excuse me, convulsions. It can cause changes in behavior, your movements, feelings, level of consciousness. Um, it may be preceded by an aura. Um, there are primary seizures um, like epilepsy, but there are also secondary seizures that could be a result of something like meningitis or stroke or um, abrupt cessation of benzodiazepines or um, quitting alcohol, cold turkey um, for people who are alcohol dependent. Those are secondary seizures. Um, epilepsy is going to be uh, a diagnose. They have had to have had two or more unprovoked seizures, meaning they're not secondary to anything else. They just occurred out of nowhere. Two or more unprovoked seizures would um, fit the criteria of epilepsy. Status epilepticus is basically intractable seizure activity. Intractable meaning nonstop, means repeated seizures occurring in 30 minutes or a prolonged seizure lasting longer than five minutes. Um, you can read here. The risk factors, um, I think we're pretty aware of these. Um, and again, this is just showing you the different types of seizures. Um, partial, I'm sorry, partial seizures are the same as focal seizures. Um, and uh, absence seizures are when a patient uh, may have um, just, uh, instances where they just freeze and stare off blankly into space. Um, so during a seizure, uh, we uh, want to maintain patient safety. Um, so we will not insert anything into the patient's mouth. Um, what you wanna do is a, remove any furniture, anything out of the way that the patient could potentially injure themselves with, um, loosen clothing so they don't choke themselves out, um, and you put a pillow under the head if the patient is on the floor, um, turn them over to their side to prevent aspiration. Um, after a seizure, a patient is going to be um, very lethargic usually. It's called a post-ictal period. Um, they, their post -ictal, they have prolonged post-ictal period, or if it is severe enough, um, they could have such a low Glasgow coma scale, they need to be intubated. Um, so if they're having chain stokes, respirations, um, grunting, they're completely unresponsive to pain and anything else, um, then we may need to intubate them. Um, also, following a seizure, um, oftentimes in that post-ictal period, patients are confused. They can become combative. Um, so uh, we just have to um, maintain safety at all costs, okay? Um, now, if a patient has a history of seizures or if we're worried about seizures, then we need to maintain seizure precautions. And that includes padding the side rails. Now, obviously we're not gonna have all four side rails up. This is a form of restraint and it is against the law to restrain a patient without a doctor's order to restrain. Um, so um, basically usually the two side rails are up or maybe you could just leave up three and put one bottom one down. Um, but either way, you cannot put all four up. Um, they make special pads for the side rails or using multiple blankets, not sheets, blankets to provide cushioning um, or pillows um, could be used. Um, and basically, it's just all about preventing a traumatic brain injury while the patient is seizing. Um, 
seizure management, again, um, anti-convulsant meds. I'll talk about those next. Um, there are many, um, but there are several uh, that need to be, um, need to be, sorry, um, uh, you need to be aware. Phenytoin, valproic acid, phenobarbital, those are some major ones you may see on exams in the future. Um, here's some other precautions, obviously, for patients to prevent seizures. Flickering lights, strobe lights, um, even the flickering light of the TV could trigger a seizure. Um, patient education, again, never stop meds abruptly. Um, even for those patients with anxiety who are taking benzodiazepines, um, stopping that medication abruptly can cause seizure activity. Um, teach them about toxicity of the meds. Um, any of the seizure meds, any medication that acts on brain chemistry initially um, in the first couple weeks of therapy can place the patient at high risk for suicide. Um, so you need to monitor for suicidal ideations, not only for patients on new psych meds, but also new anticonvulsants. Um, and then, of course, reducing triggers, um, adequate rest, nutrition, and avoiding alcohol and drugs. Here are the medications, um, like I described before. Um, you can read through this, uh, but basically some major things um, to know about certain anticonvulsant meds. Phenytoin, also known as Dilantin. That's usually the initial therapy for patients who have tonic-clonic seizures. Um, even patients coming into the emergency room in an emergent situation, um, maybe administered a loading dose or a bolus of phenytoin. Um, the things to know about phenytoin, there are numerous drug interactions. Um, many meds, you cannot mix with it. It does work by acting on uh, the way uh, calcium moves in and out of cells. So therefore, um, it can interact with uh, thyroid medicine. Um, it can interact with calcium and antacids. Um, you need to monitor the levels, therapeutic levels, and um, side effects. It may cause blood dyscrasias, like um, different anemias and abnormality of the blood cells. Um, Also, sorry, phenobarbital. Uh, phenobarb is a barbiturate. It is a narcotic. It's a sedative hypnotic. Um, the main thing, I mean, with any narcotic is monitoring for respiratory depression, those kind of things. It is commonly used in um, pediatric um, seizures. Um, it is contraindicated in hepatic disease, so it, is, it can be hepatotoxic. Um, benzodiazepines, I already uh, spoke about that. Um, okay, yeah, so benzodiazepines. Um, include diazepam, which is Valium, clonazepam, which is clonopin, lorazepam, which is Ativan, alprazolam, which is Xanax, the list goes on. Um, but anyway, um, we know benzodiazepines are narcotics, um, and they have the potential, high potential for abuse and addiction. Um, they are really only approved for the use in acute um, even seizure activity or anxiety. Um, it is not intended for long-term use, although we see patients all the time on long-term use of um, benzodiazepines. That is not the proper um, 
use. It is supposed to be used in acute episodes of panic um, or anxiety, and it is for the acute cessation of a seizure. So in the midst of a seizure, a patient may be administered lorazepam. Um, some patients, um, uh, diazepam is another common um, drug. Now they may use that um, more often with um, PEDS. Um, it, those drugs are also used to uh, prevent seizure activity with acute alcohol withdrawal. Chlordiazepoxide, also known as Librium, is uh, commonly used as well as diazepam and clonazepam. Um, if a patient is in the hospital, they're usually put, if they are an alcoholic, um, they do um, suffer from withdrawals from alcohol, they will be put on what's called a CIWA or an alcohol withdrawal protocol of some type um, where uh, meds are being administered basically round the clock to prevent uh, seizures. Um, alcohol withdrawal is one of those um, that can kill a person. Um, so uh, that's why it's so um, uh, important to treat um, their symptoms. Uh, the antidote, just a reminder from farm, is flumazenil. Um, if a patient needed for some reason the antidote administered. Of course, uh, we're very cautious about administering um, this med uh, because uh, it could potentially potentiate seizure activity. Um, benzodiazepines, again, chronic use of benzos, um, people who are taking it for anxiety even and never had a seizure, if they suddenly stop taking it, they could have a seizure. Um, finally, valproic acid, um, which is also known as valproic sodium or devalproic sodium. Um, this is a brand name Depakote. Um, it's commonly, commonly used for partial and absence seizures, but it's also used to treat bipolar disorder. Main thing you need to know about this drug, it, it, is, it is hepatotoxic. Um, so the patient is going to get their uh, liver function tested frequently. That's your ALT and your AST. Um, if used with aspirin, anticoagulants, NSAIDs, it can increase the patient's risk for bleeding. Um, and they do make sprinkle capsules that can be opened up and uh, uh, poured into applesauce or things like that for patients who have difficulty swallowing or for children. So, uh, Parkinson's disease. Um, Parkinson's disease, uh, like I said before, it uh, has to do with overstimulation of, of the uh, nerve roots, the basal ganglia, um, caused by acetylcholine, um, and then it leads to decreased dopamine. So treatment of Parkinson's is going to be aimed at inhibiting the action of acetylcholine and increasing dopamine. Um, it is a progressively debilitating disease. Progressive meaning it just keeps getting worse. Um, it doesn't have periods of remission uh, like some of the other neurological disorders like um, multiple sclerosis. Parkinson's just progressively gets worse and worse. Um, it's more common in men, typically diagnosed around the age of 50, um, but can be diagnosed as young as 40s. Um, so 40s, 50s, uh, usually when patients are first diagnosed. Uh, we know Michael J. Fox and uh, Muhammad Ali are some famous people who suffered this disease. Um, what happens uh, when a patient has, oh, another thing, I'm sorry, before I go on, chronic antipsychotic use. Chronic antipsychotic use places you at high risk. If you think about it, um, if you know about antipsychotics, a side effect of antipsychotics is those extra pyramidal symptoms, um, muscle rigidity, um, tremors. Um, so basically, symptoms of Parkinson's. 
Um, and over time, uh, if a patient, patients with schizophrenia need to be on antipsychotics for the rest of their life. Um, so after decades of using antipsychotics, they can be at high risk for Parkinson's. Um, I have uh, put a video, an excellent video um, on Parkinson's uh, on Moodle. Uh, it's about seven minutes, and it sh is showing real patients with these real-life symptoms. Um, so like I said before, it's uh, usually uh, diagnosed around age 50, um, and uh, it, is pro it progressively gets worse. Um, patients with Parkinson's have these classic symptoms of tremor, muscle rigidity, and bradykinesia. Bradykinesia is slow movement, um, muscle rigidity, obviously stiffness of the muscles, um, and, um, and then tremors. They tend to have tremors. Usually their symptoms are unilateral. It'll be one side um, having the tremors, and the tremors are usually uh, improved with movement. Um, they uh, also have what they call pill rolling um, tremors, which is like uh, rolling a pill between your fingers and your thumb. Um, that's one of the tremors they tend to have. Um, also a flat um, blank mask-like expression. Um, they have, because of their stiff muscle rigidity, um, they have this shuffling gait. And because of this, uh, this uh, bradykinesia and stiffness, um, it is going to put them at high risk for falls. Um, so please watch the video on Moodle to see more um, signs and symptoms in real life patients. Um, but yes, the pill-like tremors, the bradykinesia, the shuffling gait, these are things these are things that are specific to Parkinson's. So when you see all these symptoms here, the mask-like expression, these things are specific to Parkinson's um, and are also signs of extra pyramidal symptoms due to antipsychotic use. Um, Parkinson's management. So uh, the main treatment for Parkinson's are drugs that enhance or increase uh, dopamine. Um, so levodopa, carbidopa is a first line therapy. It is administered uh, multiple times throughout the day um, to increase dopamine in these patients. Um, there are other drugs, uh, that are used, benztropine, also known as cogentin. It is administered to patients who take antipsychotics to prevent an extrapyramidal symptoms. Um, and it is administered to patients with Parkinson's because it acts against acetylcholine. Um, so it inhibits the action of acetylcholine, um, thus uh, uh, decreasing the muscle rigidity um, they may also be on muscle relaxants um, like uh, baclofen and other muscle relaxants. Um, an antiviral known as amantadine. Um, amantadine, uh, although it is an antiviral, but it also um, increases levels of dopamine. Um, so uh, that's why it is used for Parkinson's. Um, diphenhydramine, also known as Benadryl, um, can be used to help with tremors. Um, so that's why we give that. Um, uh, nursing considerations, obviously fall precautions. Um, as their uh, um, issues get progressively worse, they may also have issues with dysphagia, um, incontinence. Um, so nursing uh, interventions are going to be all around um, safety, pre preventing aspiration, um, and uh, promoting independence as best as possible. Um, again, please watch the video on Moodle. All right, another neuromuscular disorder um, or neurological disorder, sorry, uh, multiple sclerosis.
multiple sclerosis, unlike um, Parkinson's, it is usually relapsing remitting. That's the most common type. Um, that means they have flare-ups or relapses. Um, and then they go into periods of remission where the symptoms um, will go away. Um, their symptoms are more nonspecific and can occur when they have flare-ups. They may have different things happen every time. Um, it is autoimmune. Um, and what's happening is the uh, antibodies are attacking the myelin sheath. It is a protective um, coating on the neurons, the nerves. Um, so uh, that is what's causing their neurological dysfunction. Um, and it is uh, interruption of the nerve impulses. Uh, Flare-ups can be triggered by infection, stress, yada, yada, yada. Um, the risk factors are uh, young women, uh, more common in females. They're usually, uh, the onset is usually younger um, in between ages 20 to 40. Um, genetics can also place you at risk. Um, so clinical manifestations, like I said, are pretty nonspecific. Um, oftentimes they have um, uh, visual disturbances, diplopia, which is double vision. Um, Utah sign is uh, um, a uh, temporary worsening of vision. Um, and other neurological functions. Uh, they have random, like I said, their, their, uh, their symptoms can be pretty vague and nonspecific. So therefore, when you get tested on multiple sclerosis, it's usually not necessarily asking you about symptoms, um, but more so uh, maybe considerations for safety, medications, things like that, but uh, specific symptoms. I mean, they have different neurological symptoms every time they have a flare-up. Um, diagnosis is made with MRI. MRI, um, when they have these clusters of uh, myelin uh, degradation, they will uh, have plaque-like appearances of the brain uh, or spine show up on MRI. So MRI is the diagnostic um, test for multiple sclerosis. You could do a lumbar puncture. That's usually if they're, you know, when a person gets these neurological workups, they're ruling out everything because a lot of the times all the symptoms are pretty much similar. Um, treatment, it is autoimmune. So treatment is going to be just like any other autoimmune disorder, corticosteroids, DMARs, which are um, disease modifying autoimmune. Um, what does the R stand for? I don't know, look it up. But those drugs um, um, modify the immune system and can cause immunosuppression just like other immunosuppressant agents. Um, muscle relaxants may also be used. These referrals are the same for anyone with neurological dysfunction. Occupational therapy, OT, deals with fine motor skills, fine motor skills, feeding yourself, dressing yourself, performing your ADLs. Um, they may deal with adaptive devices to help you feed yourself, etc. Uh, PT, physical therapy, they deal with gross motor skills, walking, um, using a wheelchair, using a cane, using a walker. Speech, they deal with difficulty swallowing, difficulty pronouncing words, dysarthria, cognition. Um, patients are going to be on fall precautions. We want to promote independence, um, and we want to teach these patients how to um, prevent triggers like uh, stress, infection, yada, yada. All right, uh, amyotrophic uh, lateral sclerosis, also known as ALS or Lou Gehrig's disease. This is a progressive uh, uh, neurological disorder. 
um, causes destruction of the neurons, the motor neurons, um, therefore uh, destroying the somatic nervous system. Um, and this leads to um, severe muscular atrophy and weakness. Um, patients end up in a wheelchair um, and then eventually they're bed bound um, until, you know, they pass away. Um, treatment is primarily supportive. Famous persons who have had this disease, uh, obviously Luke Garrett, um, Stephen Hawking. Stephen Hawkins, um, trying to remember what movie it was, but it was about his life, famous, um, oh gosh, oh, oh God, sorry. Uh, he's a famous uh, scientist. And um, anyways, he, uh, he had Lou Gehrig's disease, end up in a wheelchair. Um, you know, had to speak with a computer, uh, the wheelchair was operated by his mouth, you know, so complete generalized weakness. Um, oh, and I'm sorry, I'm, because of that, there is no cure. So treatment is mainly supportive. There is a medication thought to possibly slow down the progression, but Again, this is a very specified disease. The main thing um, you would want to know is just that this is progressive and it's going to be fatal um, and providing psychosocial support and that it's going to cause um, severe weakness. Um, myasthenia gravis, sorry, this is another autoimmune disorder similar um, to uh, MS in that it does have flare-ups and then it goes into periods of remission. Um, however, the flare-ups of myasthenia gravis or what they call a myasthenia crisis is going to be uh, probably much, uh, most time more serious than a flare-up of MS in that the thing with myasthenia gravis is it causes descending weakness, weakness from the chest down. So the um, symptoms that they tend, well, from the head down, sorry, the symptoms they tend to have are going to be in the face, but more um, concerning is the respiratory muscles, respiratory muscles. Um, so during a myasthenia crisis, patients may end up intubated. Um, and so then just like uh, MS, they're going to get treated and symptoms will go away. But during that crisis, during that time period, they may need mechanical ventilation support. Um, what's happening is they are, uh, the autoimmune disorder is, I'm sorry, the antibodies are attacking um, acetylcholine receptors. Um, so therefore, um, the, the muscles are not able to receive that signal um, from the nerve um, because the receptors of acetylcholine are being um, attacked. Um, and remember, acetylcholine is uh, responsible for muscle contraction. So if I'm not having any muscular contraction from the head down, um, you'll see this picture here. Uh, they're going to have change in facial, sorry, facial appearance, uh, drooping eye like doggy, or I'm sorry, the droopy dog eye, which is ptosis, um, smoothing of the wrinkles in the face. But the most alarming is going to be obviously difficulty swallowing, and difficulty controlling the respiratory, the respirations. Um, so the thing about myasthenia gravis is monitoring respiratory set status. Um, diagnosis is made by a positive tensilon test. Positive tensilon test. Um, what tensilon does is it increases the action of acetylcholine. So if we administer uh, the tensilon, uh, this is a drug, tensilon is a medication. If we administer that IV, 
um, and the patient has an increase in um, muscle strength temporarily, uh, then we can diagnose them with myasthenia gravis. By we, I mean probably the doctor, right? <laughs> so a Tensilon test is the diagnostic testing for myasthenia gravis. Treatment is going to be aimed at um, Sorry. Treatment is going to be aimed at uh, stopping the breakdown of acetylcholine, uh, anticholinesterase. Now, medical terminology, when you see this ending, uh, esterase, when we talk about pancreolipase, A's, 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 that means it's an enzyme. Enzymes cause the breakdown or metabolism of substances, foods, whatever. So anti-cholinesterase, cholinesterase would break down acetylcholine. So um, anti-cholinesterase medication, peridostigmine, is going to increase the action of acetylcholine. So because of that, it, it overdose toxicity, it could cause acute crisis. Um, uh, called cholinergic crisis, um, which is due to uh, excessive stimulation of the muscles, which again, that excessive stimulation of the muscles is eventually going to lead to severe weakness because of the overstimulation. Um, in that case, when a patient's in cholinergic crisis, atropine is an anticholinergic. It is the antidote. Um, and again, like I said, acute crisis, myasthenia crisis, um, when a patient has a flare-up, could cause for mechanical ventilation. Cholinergic crisis is going to be caused by medication overdose. Um, again, cholinergic crisis, this is just telling you about what that is, where stimulation of the muscles is going to eventually lead to weakness and flaccid muscles thus causing these side effects, salivation, uh, which is excessive, um, you know, saliva, lacrimation, which is tearing um, of the eyes, okay, excessive tearing, urination, defecation, um, everything's going to be all relaxed, okay, from overstimulation. Um, and then uh, here's some other signs and symptoms. Um, so these, initially, they're going to have uh, muscle cramping, tachycardia, weakness, twitching, fasciculations. Fasciculations, again, is twitching of the face, okay? All right. And then this is just a table just showing you the difference uh, differences amongst those uh, three disorders. Um, now... Gillian Barre. Gillian Barre is an acute autoimmune attack on the um, peripheral um, and some cranial nerve myelin again, um, similar to uh, MS. However, this uh, damage is uh, reversible and it's usually caused by uh, an infection. Um, it, it can also be related to administration of vaccines, sometimes um, rare circumstance. Patients with those live vaccines with a live virus or whatever being injected are at risk for Guillain-Barre, or not at risk, but it can happen, a rare complication. Um, so um this uh the difference between this and myasthenia gravis is that it causes ascending weakness so it's going to be um from the feet up um so it's going to start down in the legs they're going to have leg weakness first um signs and symptoms again signs and symptoms of weakness hypo uh, reflexia paresthesia numbness could have pain um the thing to know about Guillain-Barre is that it's usually preceded by an infection. Um, it causes ascending weakness, and um, they usually have recovery within um, 
few months to years. It could take, you know, one to two years to fully recover. Um, plasmapheresis is similar to dialysis, except um, that we're cleansing the plasma uh, of the blood um, for antibodies. Um, so they're pulling the blood out of the body, they're filtering out antibodies out of the plasma, and then putting it back in the, in the body. Moving right along, let's talk about headaches. Headaches, um, very common complaint, right? Um, there are several types of headaches. Tension headaches are by far the most common. Um, tension headaches um, occur uh, with pain behind the eyes um, or behind the foreheads, usually bilateral. Uh, patients will complain that it feels like a tight band around the head. Um, these are usually, um, you know, easily treated with NSAIDs, over-the-counter medications, um, and usually can go away, you know, within an hour, 30 minutes or so. Um, they can originate from uh, different trigger points um, and are definitely more common in females. Uh, they are thought to be related to excess hormones. Um, so, yeah. Uh, migraine. Migraine, the pain is usually unilateral. Migraines um, tend to be chronic um, and affect usually one side of the head at a time. Um, patients with migraine disorders um, tend to complain of the same type of uh, symptoms every time they have a flare-up. Um, these uh, headaches can be debilitating. The pain can be very severe. Um, getting in the way of the patient, even performing their daily um, activities of daily living. Um, symptoms can last anywhere from four to 72 hours. Um, treatment, now while treatment may include NSAIDs and acetaminophen, um, they may also include um, specialized medications like triptans. Triptans, like sumatriptan, which is also known as Imatrex, very common drug, um, it works by producing vasoconstriction. Um, so uh, same with ergotamine preparations. Um, yeah. So um, calcium channel blockers, beta blockers, and anti-epileptics such as gabapentin, Lyrica, um, Topamax, not really Lyrica, sorry, Topamax, um, there's, there's multiple anticoagulant, uh, anticonvulsants, sorry, um, but these drugs are used usually for prevention of migraines. Um, finally, last kind of headache is cluster headaches. Cluster headaches typically occur behind one eye um, or in the temporal region. Um, it's usually sharp, intense, throbbing pain, um, and uh, it's a sudden onset of intense pain. It can occur multiple times per day. Um, it's typical uh, for these to occur during uh, season changing, um, like in the spring or fall. Uh, during that time frame, patient may have multiple um, cluster headaches. And then it can go into remission for six months with no cluster headache whatsoever. So um, treatment is going to be similar to migraines. The only difference is with cl cluster headaches, you may also administer high flow oxygen, like 10 to 12 liters, um, to help relieve symptoms. Um, with headaches, um, now, there are, these are your primary headaches. Um, there are headaches that can be secondary um, due to a stroke, brain tumor, aneurysm, what have you. Um, all right. Now, oops, sorry. Uh, cerebral blood flow. 
So when we talk about this, we're talking about circulation through, um, you know, all the blood vessels, the um, blood vessels that provide uh, blood to the brain. Um, that makes up uh, the blood going to your brain makes up about 15% of your cardiac output. So a good portion of blood flow coming to the brain. Um, the brain is uh, sensitive to increases and decreases in blood flow, increases and decreases in blood pressure. Um, and there are, <clears throat> are many different mechanisms involved in maintaining uh, intracranial pressure, good blood pressure to the brain, right? Um, or cerebral blood pressure, sorry. So, um, uh, CVA, a cerebral vascular accident, is really just an event that leads to decreased perfusion of the brain. All right, so when we talk about cerebral vascular disorders, um, that can refer to aneurysms, um, uh, arterial venous malformations, but the most common cerebral vascular disorder is stroke. Um, stroke is uh, the fifth leading cause of death in the United States. It is the leading cause of serious long-term disability in the United States. Non-modifiable risk factors include age um, and race. African Americans are at significantly higher risk um, for uh, CVA. Um, so it is imperative that we talk to our African American patients about managing hypertension. Um, modifiable risk factors are the same as those with cardiovascular disease and atherosclerosis. Um, the only new one here is going to be uh, the oral contraceptive use. Use of oral contraceptives, especially in conjunction with smoking, places patients at significant um, risk for uh, clots and ischemic stroke. Um, DVT, um, typically estrogen. Um, anything com uh, containing estrogen um, can place the patient at risk for uh, blood clots and CVA. A transient ischemic attack, it is a temporary uh, neuro neurological deficit. So what's happening is these patients are having uh, stroke-like symptoms, but um, all the symptoms of a stroke, However, the symptoms will subside in less than 15 minutes. So um, if you think of the word transient, that's a word they use to describe homeless people or people that move around often, transient. So what happens is a clot um, will come, an embolus, because it travels from elsewhere usually, will come. It will cut off blood flow, like in this picture, temporarily. But then in less than 15 minutes, it will get pushed through and um, go on about its business and the symptoms will resolve. Um, the reason we need to take this seriously, um, while the symptoms will go away and there's no irreversible damage or anything, this could be a warning sign of something more um, ominous about to happen in the future. Um, so. TIA will definitely get admitted to the hospital um, just to get a workup to uh, make sure they're not at like super high risk for a stroke. All right, so, um, now, TIA, like I said, the symptoms will resolve in less than 15 minutes. There will be no irreversible damage to the brain versus a stroke. A stroke 
is a sudden loss um, in uh, uh, blood supply to a part of the brain, which can lead to necrosis and uh, tissue death, right? Um, there are two types of stroke. There's ischemic, which is the uh, most common. Um, and I have included some YouTube links, but I'm not going to play them. You can watch those on your own time. And then there's hemorrhagic, um, uh, which is less common and much uh, often much more serious um, with a poorer prognosis uh, than ischemic. Um, with ischemic stroke, that is usually caused by a thrombus or an embolus. A thrombus is a clot that occurs right in the vessel. Embolus is a clot that traveled from elsewhere, um, like with uh, AFib or something like that. Uh, and then hemorrhagic is usually caused by excessively high blood pressure or ruptured aneurysm, um, and it's going to lead to a rupture of a blood vessel. So ischemic stroke, um, I've already uh, indicated that. What happens is either a clot occurs right there in the cranial um, arteries. Uh, to uh, atherosclerosis or a clot from elsewhere. Um, symptoms really depend on the location um, that is affected. I'll talk about that in a minute. I'm pretty sure we're all aware of the um, signs and symptoms of stroke. Um, that would include uh, facial asymmetry, weakness, or uh, paralysis of the arm or leg. Um, and it's usually all unilateral, one-sided. Um, they may have difficulty speaking, change in level of consciousness, complaints, a headache. Uh, preventative measures. Um, so when we've identified that someone is at risk, um, we're going to want to prevent a stroke. Um, obviously, with all people, we already talked about this, we're going to promote a low-fat, um, low-sodium diet for everyone. Um, it doesn't matter. We don't want anyone to be at risk for heart disease or stroke. Um, carotid endarterectomy, we, um, when we talked about uh, procedures to remove uh, get rid of plaque and everything. Um, uh, last week, when we talked about uh, atherosclerosis, um, we would not do a, um, a ather atherectomy uh, where they go in with the drill, like a uh, rotor rooter, and drill out the plaque. Um, we don't want to do that in the carotid arteries only because it will be so easy for a piece of plaque to travel to the brain. So instead, what they do is a carotid endarterectomy, and that is making an incision in the carotid artery and removing the plaque. Um, other, uh, other preventative measures is anticoagulation um, for patients with things like atrial fibrillation, and also mechanical heart valves, uh, those things, uh, and also um, patients with new um, uh, joints, joint replacements. Uh, we'll talk about that um, when we talk about musculoskeletal disorders, but joint replacements, um, artificial um, heart valves, atrial fibrillation, making sure these patients are uh, properly anticoagulated so they're not at risk for a, um, ischemic stroke. Antiplatelet therapy um, for those with atherosclerosis or those who have had a TIA in the past, they're usually going to be placed on aspirin or clopidogrel, which is like Plavix. Statin therapy like atorvastatin, rosuvastatin, cholesterol meds, the goal is to keep the LDL under 100. Um, Antihypertensives, of course, to keep your blood pressure down. Um, so during the acute phase of an ischemic stroke, prompt diagnosis and treatment is critical. Um, when we have a patient exhibiting signs and symptoms of stroke, like I said before, the CAT scan is critical. We want to get that done right away. 
um, it should be not only done, but resulted, like read by the radiologist, reported back to the doctor within 45 minutes. Um, so uh, if we notice our patient is having signs and symptoms of a stroke, because it can happen to anyone, could come to the hospital for something minor and end up with something major. Um, so if you're um, seeing your patient exhibiting signs and symptoms of stroke, every hospital has a code. This is one of those times where you um, alert the uh, whatever your emergency operating system in the hospital and call that code. Um, over the intercom. Uh, so, for example, the hospital I worked at, the code for stroke was code 66. So, if I'm working in med surge or, or even if I'm working in ER, um, if we have a patient coming in um, and the ambulance has called code 66, um, let us know. We're going to call, um, pick up that phone and dial code 66. If uh, uh, patient, I'm talking to my patient, I'm giving my meds, and all of a sudden I see that they have a right-sided facial droop, the right arm is numb, and they're talking all funny, then I'm going to pick up the phone and call a code 66. What this does, it doesn't only um, send a rapid response team to my room, it also alerts the cat, <clears throat> CAT scan department to get ready kick out any patients that are down there not and not you know in the kindest way possible but we need to get ready because we got a cat scan that it's it's critical that we perform this cat scan right now the reason this is critical is because thrombolytic therapy thrombolytic therapy can reverse um and uh prevent the uh ischemia of the brain um, by busting those clots, but it has to be administered usually in less than three hours of onset. Um, so that's why we have to be hasty when a patient has new onset stroke symptoms. Now, it's not as big of an issue when a patient is telling you that they've been having these stroke symptoms for two days, something like that. Um, then they would no longer be a candidate for thrombolytic therapy. It has to be administered within three hours of onset. ATI says four and a half. I think somewhere else in ATI it says six hours, but generally it's less than three hours. Um, assessment for a stroke. This is um, important for you to know. You need to know the NIH stroke scale. Um, have a general idea of what it is. I have included a video on Moodle of the stroke scale. Um, I've also put a slide in here with the um, whole assessment. Um, the other things, I mean, monitoring, uh, I mean, we're going to do that for anybody, right? Thrombolytic therapy. So what is that? Altaplase, also known as TPA or retoplase, these are drugs that are known as clot busters. Not all anticoagulants bust clots. What they do is rather prevent clots from forming and your body breaks down the clots itself. Thrombolytic therapy is actually gonna go in and break down the clots. Um, uh, like I said, in ATI, it says four and a half hours um, to be used. Um, it can be used in uh, acute MI, especially in a STEMI, um, and also uh, ischemic stroke. <sighs> but yeah, so um, because these drugs um, have the potential to I mean, they do dissolve clots, that's what they do. They have the potential to cause serious bleeding. Um, what can actually happen is uh, during administration of TPA, you can actually have the symptoms of stroke resolve when the clot is dissolved, but then have them suddenly return uh, because now the patient has had a hemorrhagic stroke. Um, so um, there are very strict criteria 
Um, like I said, it, it can only be administered uh, within usually three hours, most hospital protocols. Um, I did post on Moodle the American Heart Association guidelines um, for administration of TPA. Every hospital has their own protocol. Um, but after so many hours, that tissue death has already occurred. And so um, the reperfusion dissolving the clot is not going to um, change the outcome for the patient. Um, so because of the risk for bleeding, anyone who's had history of uh, hemorrhagic stroke um, or uh, GI bleed, anybody with issues with bleeding, Anyone who's already on um, anticoagulant may not be uh, the best candidate. Um, anyone with severely elevated blood pressure, um, again, every hospital has their own uh, protocol. Usually it's like if their blood pressure is greater than 180 or 160 or something like that, um, then do not administer. Um, also, um, when you're planning to give this med, um, you need to get all your lab draws, all your sticks and prods, any um, invasive procedures, inserting Foley catheter, any of that. It needs to get done before administration of the drug. And that patient is going to need to go to the ICU at least 24 to 48 hours for monitoring once they've been administered that type of medication. Um, next, we have hemorrhagic strokes. Hemorrhagic strokes uh, cause decreased perfusion of the brain, but this time it's due to bleeding in the brain. Um, I want to go. I want to go back to something I forgot to say. Um, when we talk about uh, cerebral blood flow, not only is the blood bringing oxygen to the tissue, but our nerves need glucose to function. Um, without glucose, uh, our nerves uh, have trouble um, functioning. So in the event of stroke-like symptoms, in the event of a seizure, uh, one of the primary assessments is to check a blood glucose. Hypoglycemia can mimic symptoms of stroke. Hypoglycemia can cause convulsions. Um, so um, it is important uh, when a patient is having stroke symptoms or a seizure, check the blood sugar. Um, now, uh, hemorrhagic stroke, what uh, can happen? Um, this can happen from a rupture of an aneurysm like you see here. It can happen just from a spontaneous uh, severe hypertension. Um, and different uh, cerebrovascular, uh, um, sorry, cerebrovascular um, malformations, like an AV malformation or something. Um, either way, even if a traumatic brain injury, if somebody got hit in the head with a bat, if somebody got shot in the head, it's still the same thing is going on, bleeding on the brain. The way our skull is built, if you look at this picture here, our skull, and then we have our brain. There's really not much wiggle room for bleeding to occur. Um, so it doesn't take much, um, I mean, for bleeding, a tumor, aneurysm, any of those things are going to increase what we call intracranial pressure, increase pressure on the brain. Um, same with meningitis, inflammation, uh, but we'll talk about that more in a second. So hemorrhagic stroke, when we do the CAT scan, the CAT scan will show bleeding. It will not show ischemia initially. It will show bleeding. So when we do the CAT scan, if we don't say, see bleeding, but we see stroke symptoms, then um, we can determine once we've ruled out hemorrhagic, we know the patient is having an ischemic stroke. Um, so uh, management of uh, hemorrhagic stroke, um, one, uh, control of hypertension. We need tight control of the blood pressure. 
if we've already burst the pipe here and we've got blood flowing out, having high blood pressure is going to cause more blood to pour out into the um, uh, brain uh, at a faster rate, right? So we want to have tight control of the blood pressure. Um, diagnosis, again, CAT scan. Uh, we may also perform cerebral angiography to uh, look at a uh, patient's um, risk for a stroke, just like a cardiac catheterization, just like a renal angiogram, any other angiogram. That's where they're putting that catheter into the artery and injecting dye and watching that um, dye go travel up the artery to the brain. So same thing, may go in through the femoral artery, may go in through the radial or brachial artery, uh, but the, uh, usually radial artery, um, but that's an angiogram. Um, and then lumbar puncture, uh, maybe to rule out um, if there is um, a subarachnoid hemorrhage. Um, so uh, the prognosis for hemorrhagic stroke is typically kind of poor. They tend to have poor outcomes. Uh, these are your patients who tend to die um, from a stroke. When they die from a stroke, it's usually a hemorrhagic stroke. Um, bed rest, sedation, um, the treatment of increased intracranial pressure, which I'll talk about in a minute, um, and uh, prevention of seizures um, and prevention of increasing um, intracranial pressure surgical um, procedures. Oh, and uh, clinical manifestations for stroke are typically the same as far as the unilateral weakness and paralysis. However, that thunderclap, sudden worst headache of my life um, is going to be more common with hemorrhagic stroke. Um, and because of increasing or intracranial pressure, they will have um, maybe sudden change in le level of consciousness. These may be your patients that face plant and lose consciousness. They may have projectile vomiting from increased intracranial pressure. Um, um, they may have bleeding, like a nosebleed, uh, excessive nosebleed, something like that. Um, bleeding from the ears. Um, Treatment now, surgical um, procedures to release that pressure on the brain. They may do a craniotomy, which is a removal of a piece of the skull, or they may drill burr holes into the skull. Here's a patient who's recovered from burr holes. Um, with the craniotomy, this piece of skull is removed. Um, it's usually uh, then placed elsewhere in the body or harvested um, elsewhere in the body to be kept alive. And then when um, the time is right, they will go for another surgery to have that uh, flat replaced. Um, so that's a craniotomy. Um, osmotic diuretics are medications to reduce uh, cerebral edema. Manitol is that medication. Manitol is an osmotic diuretic. It can reduce the uh, intracranial pressure. Um, again, there's no real, like how TPA can bust up the clot and stop it. There's really nothing we can do um, to stop the bleeding, um, but relieving intracranial pressure um, is really the goal for a hemorrhagic stroke. So that's why we say it's supportive care. Now, I keep saying that term, intracranial pressure. What is it? It is the pressure of fluids um, exerted on the brain. So different from cerebral blood flow and cerebral pressure, this is the pressure of fluid exerted on the brain, okay? In between the brain and the skull. Um, so. 
This can be increased when there is a mass in the brain, like a brain tumor or an aneurysm. It can be increased with head injury, obviously stroke, um, especially hemorrhagic, um, and excessive rapid IV infusions can also lead to cerebral edema and increase intracranial pressure. Meningitis, because it is inflammation. So your meninges are going to be swollen, meningitis. Inflammation, inflammation. You're going to have vasodilation. You're going to have swelling, um, heat, warmth. Um, so same thing um, with meningitis. Um, they, uh, that swelling can cause increased intracranial pressure. But what are the manifestations of that? Changes in mental status. Initially, they will be agitated, restless, confused, babies. They have high-pitched crying, restlessness. But as intracranial pressure gets worse or um, increases, they're going to become lethargic, somnolent, obtunded, or comatose, okay? Babies may become difficult to arouse. Um, again, that sudden onset, severe, worst headache of my life, also described as a thunderclap headache, sign of increased intracranial pressure. Seizures, increase, increased intracranial pressure can cause seizures. Remember, seizures can be primary, like with epilepsy, where they're just unprovoked, or they can be secondary, secondary to increase intracranial pressure. Cushing's triad, um, that is severe hypertension, bradycardia, and a wide pulse pressure. Wide pulse pressure is my systolic, my top blood pressure, minus my bottom blood pressure. What happens is that big that number gets bigger and bigger. Those two numbers, the top and bottom number, become further and further apart. Um, this has to do with the baroreceptors in the brain. Uh, those posturing, the um, that is a sign of increased intracranial pressure. Um, my pupils are no longer equal or reactive to light. Um, so that is a late sign. Um, changes in respirations. Um, they may have fever um, due to damage to the autonomic nervous system and bulging fontanelles for your baby. Again, here's your uh, signs and symptoms. Uh, treatment or uh, nursing considerations. Maintaining, again, think about it. If I lay them flat or if the head, if I elevate the legs or anything, blood is rushing to the head, right? So we want to maintain an elevated head of bed, usually around 30 degrees. Avoid flexion at the waist. Avoid um laying them in a fetal position, avoid sitting them too far upright, and they don't need to be in a high fowler's position. Um, avoid uh, bending at the waist, uh, I'm sorry, uh, bending over if a patient's going home um, and you wanna teach them about increases in intracranial pressure. You don't want them bending over, um, don't want them doing any heavy lifting. Um, other, um, other things to be considerate of is seizure precautions. Again, reducing stimuli, uh, keeping the room dark, quiet, very quiet, limiting the number of people in the room. Um, as far as assessment, again, monitor vital signs extremely closely. Um, Glasgow Coma Scale. If my Glasgow coma scale is becoming less and less and less, likely my uh, intracranial pressure is going up and up and up, um, causing changes in my neurological function. EEG, MRI, CT, those are different tests you can do. Here's that NIH stroke scale I told you about. I put a good video on Moodle for you to watch. It's just a couple minutes, like five, six minutes of a doctor performing this test and explaining every step of the way. This is um, something you will do regularly. When you're in the hospital, this is what they consider neuro checks. Um, when we're doing neuro checks on a patient, this is what we're doing. 
Um, um, and the score, of course, is going to um, let us know, uh, you know, the severity of their stroke symptoms. Um, this, when we were giving TPA, we should, we, our goal is to see this number become less and less and see improvement um, in their movement. Um, so we already talked about the acute phase. So um, after the acute phase, um, you know, once we've gotten through the emergent issues, um, thrombolytic therapy, whatever, during their hospital stay now, um, we're going to be monitoring, uh, still going to be monitoring neurological and mental status. Um, we're going to monitor their motor control. We're going to keep doing that NIH stroke scale. We need to know about their ability to swallow. They need swallow evaluation prior to us, um, you know, giving them a diet and, a, and stroke protocol. That patient is going to be NPO until it's determined they can swallow. A bedside swallow test um, would involve you as the nurse giving the patient a cup of water and they are to drink it all um, in under so many seconds. Um, and I've post uh, a, a sheet on that in Moodle as well. Uh, signs and symptoms of dysphagia would be coughing, obviously that they're choking, or changes in their voice, gurgling, sounding like they're drowning, okay? Those are signs and symptoms that the patient is aspirating. If they fail the bedside swallow test by the nurse, now mind you, if their look, if their mental status uh, is completely altered, do not even do the bedside swallow study. Keep them MPO. This patient has to be able to follow commands and all that um, before you administer a bedside swallow study or uh, swallow test. Um, and then if that is failed then they remain in PO and they're going to be evaluated by speech therapy. Speech therapy deals with the swallowing and dysphagia. Um, we're going to need to monitor nutritional status because they may be on an altered diet. They may be on a puree diet. They may need their liquids thickened. Remember, we talked about dysphagia with the GI chapters. Um, Obviously, skin integrity is going to be an issue, um, and I'll talk about that more uh, with spinal cord injury and immobility, but we're going to need to protect them from skin breakdown um, and bowel and bladder function, and I'll talk about that more later. Left versus right. So when we say hemisphere, hemisphere refers to the side of the brain affected. So left hemisphere is responsible mainly for language and logic, left language logic, okay? Speech, reading, analytical thought, math. These are things that are controlled by the left brain. Um, most of us are right-handed. Um, the right side of the body is controlled by the left brain. So most of us are rational thinkers. Um, most of us um, use our right hand to write and we are rational thinkers versus um, you, I'm sure you've heard before, left-handed people tend to be more creative. Um, why? Because their left or their right brain is more dominant. Um, right brain is responsible for abstract thought, um, artistic, musical function, emotions, um, uh, shapes, um, recognizing patterns. By recognizing patterns, that also includes recognizing your family members. Um, depth perception, perception and spatial awareness, hand-eye coordination. Um, so these people tend to be more artistic um, when they are left-handed usually. Now, when a stroke affects one or the other side of the brain, um, that will explain the damage that occurs, the symptoms that occur. Patient with less, uh, um, I'm sorry, left brain damage um, is are going to have issues with language. They're going to have difficulty speaking, aphasia. They're going to have difficulty reading, maybe, um, writing. 
um, reading and understanding written word. Um, they may have trouble, um, uh, they may have slow, cautious behaviors. They may um, have right-sided, obviously the right side of the body is gonna be affected. Um, also, uh, right side of the brain. Now, they're gonna have altered depth perception. They may be unable to recognize their family members and they're gonna have left-sided hemiparesis. And because they cannot feel the left side of their body, they cannot see maybe on the left side of their body. Because of that, and because their inability to use the right brain where they're able to have abstract thought. Now they're more black and white thinkers. Well, I can't see it, I can't feel it, therefore it's not there. So patients with strokes on the right side of the brain are going to have neglect on the left side. Um, they may completely forget the left side of their body. So therefore, when patients have neglect, we need to put objects and do everything on the right side so that they can see. We need to orient them to the left side of their body. They do things like mirror therapy or um, have them touch and feel the left side of their body. Um, and because uh, this is the right side controlling the emotional um, part of the brain, they're going to have poor impulse control. Um, some other terms to know uh, as far as um, effects of stroke. That's going to be, um, sorry, I'm trying to, these Zoom controls are in my way. Okay, um, so um, motor, uh, I'm sorry, so uh, things that are affected, uh, terms to know when we're talking about stroke. Now, Hemisphere talks about what side of the body versus hemiplegia. When we say hemi, we mean one side. Um, plegia means paralysis, okay? Um, paralysis of one side, like quadriplegia, paraplegia. Hemiplegia is one whole side of the body is, or, uh, is plegic, and hemiparesis is weakness. Apraxia is difficulty in coordinating movement. So this could affect motor. This can also affect speech because you have uh, uncoordinated movements of the mouth and tongue. Um, dysarthria is dis, uh, uh, difficulty pronouncing words. Dysphagia is difficulty swallowing. Um, and aphasia is difficulty speaking. Expressive aphasia means I have difficulty saying what I want to say. I know what I want to say. I'm here, you know, I'm alert. I'm able um, to think what I want to say, but I'm unable to say it. Words don't come out right. Versus receptive aphasia, um, and that is trouble understanding and processing what is being said to me. So, um, those patients cannot, they don't know um, what people are saying to them. They don't understand. Global aphasia is going to be a combination of both. They don't understand language and they can't speak. Um, uh, hemani, hem, uh, hemianopsia, hemianopsia, however you say it, uh, is blindness in half the visual field in one or both eyes. And agnosia is inability to recognize objects. Um, so you're going to show them pictures in the NIH stroke scale. You show them pictures. Um, you're testing for agnosia to see if they're able to name the object. Um, obviously, um, preventing complications of immobility. You can read through this. Um, you want to prevent contractures, um, and this is similar with patients um, with uh, patients with um, spinal cord injuries. Uh, same uh, with the referrals: PT for gross motor, OT for fine motor. They may also need adaptive devices or wrist splints, things like that. Um, nursing considerations: We want to promote independence, enhance self-care. Um, 
set goals that are realistic, okay? If the patient has right-sided hemiparesis, uh, they're probably never going to run a triathlon, okay? But they may be able to still live independently. Um, so set goals that are realistic. Um, and not only that, goals that enhance patient motivation. If we're setting the standard too high and they just keep failing, they're going to become depressed. Um, again, uh, you need to read in your book about neglect um, and uh, ways to deal with the patient who suffers from neglect. Um, use of assistive devices, yada, yada. Nutrition, again, consult with speech therapy. Everyone having a stroke should be consulted by speech therapy. Um, they also, um, different things, methods to um, avoid aspiration. Um, and that may include a modified diet. Bowel and bladder training, I will talk about that more. Um, in uh, spinal cord injury. Um, home care, again, just uh, treatment of prevention, uh, medication compliance, safety measures, yada, yada. Um, so uh, same things we've been talking about. Now, uh, spinal cord injuries. Um, spinal cord injuries are basically partial or complete disruption of the nerve tract, like it says here. Um, this can result in, uh, in a minor or com a minor uh, nerve dysfunction or complete uh, paralysis and, and uh, disruption of the autonomic nervous system. Okay. Um, and so uh, risk factors for spinal cord injuries are going to include young males, especially 16 to 30 years old. Um, obviously any trauma, motor vehicle crash or motor vehicle accident, MVC, MVA, whatever you wanna call it, falls, uh, violence, sports, you know, football, um, these uh, contact sports, especially um, osteoporosis is going to put you at risk for fractures. Um, well, fractures, but, uh, and then a fracture of the spine could cause spinal cord injury. There's a difference between a vertebral fracture and a spinal cord injury. The vertebrae are the bones um, that uh, the spinal cord is encased in. You could essentially fracture your vertebrae without having a spinal cord injury. Um, however, if you fracture a vertebrae, it's the fragment of bone that could potentially cause injury to the spinal cord. You could have contusion, which would be like a hematoma or um, swelling, like bruising um, to the spinal cord. Um, you could have compression of the spinal cord caused by swelling um, or a compression um, where the nerves are compressed for some reason, a bulging disc, something like that. Or you could have complete transection, and that's when a patient becomes paralyzed below the injury. So if the, if the uh, nerves are severed, there is no regeneration, okay? Um, so this picture here, I just took from a different um, textbook. It is just showing you the different levels and where, um, how these um, nerves innervate the rest of the body from the spinal cord. So the um, ganglia, the root, is here in the spinal cord and then um, the peripheral nerves where they lead to and what they control. Therefore, for example, um, in your C1, 2, 3, and 4, it's controlling your diaphragm. It's controlling your, um, your parotid glands, your lacrimal glands. So when those nerves are severed and the patient has C-spine injury, the nerves are severed, 
these patients are going to have issues with breathing. Uh, severed C1, C2, those patients, I mean, they could be a risk for death, okay, or just ending up on um, mechanical ventilation for the rest of their life. Uh, uh, C-spine injury, right? All right, so that's going to be partial or complete quadriplegia. Quadriplegia means partial or complete paralysis of all four extremities. Quad means four. Plegia means paralysis, right? Tetraplegia is just another name used for quadriplegia. Um, of course, like I said, because of where those no nerves are, we're going to be concerned about respiratory dysfunction. Um, they're definitely going to lose control of the bladder, bowel, um, alteration in sexual function. Um, they're going to have alterations in um, temperature. They uh, tend, when patients have those uh, C spine injuries, they tend to have hypothermia. They can't auto regulate their um, temperature. They like to be wrapped up in blankets all the way up to their head. Um, thoracic spine injury. Um, those can cause partial or complete paraplegia. Um, again, if you go back to that picture and see what nerves control what, um, the upper uh, thoracic spine innervates the, um, the spinal cord innervates the chest. So again, those patients, the intercostal muscles, the diaphragm, uh, um, they may have uh, loss of trunk control. Um, so uh, the abdominal muscles. So um, because of this, it just depends on where the injury is. If it's a T4 or above, they may not even be able to sit up because their upper body strength is so weak. Um, again, loss of bowel and bladder control, sexual dysfunction. Now, any injury above T6 is going to be at risk for a severe um, complication um, that could lead to death called autonomic dysreflexia. Um, and that is basically um, your autonomic, your parasympathetic and your sympathetic nervous system should be balancing each other out. Um, because of the place of the injury, the spinal cord controls mostly that autonomic nervous system, remember? So um, they can have autonomic dysreflexia in certain situations. And I'll talk about that in a second. And again, the respiratory complication. So autonomic dysreflexia, again, that is at injury T6 or higher. It can be triggered usually with um, restrictive clothing or anything that's going to cause compression um, down below, um, stimuli at or below the injury, okay? Um, so tight clothing. Um, pressure, um, uh, having a pressure or painful stimulus, uh, fecal impaction and bladder um, retention is going to be uh, the most common cause of autoreflexia. So um, sounds crazy, but again, this comes back to elimination. It is uh, important to empty the bladder and do the bladder training or if a patient requires straight catheterization because a full distended bladder could cause this autonomic dysreflexia. Um, what that's going to look like is we're going to have vasoconstriction below the injury. So those the below the injury, you're going to have coolness, pale um, uh, extremities. But above the, um, the constriction, wherever that stimulus is, above that area, it's going to have vasodilation. So it's going to lead to rapid, um, severe elevations in blood pressure. Your face may, their face may be flushed. They may have diaphoresis, um, uh, increased heart rate, um, increased or decreased heart rate, sorry. Um, 
uh, descended neck veins. So um, these are things, um, I'm sorry, decreased heart rate. These are things um, you need to be aware of. Autonomic dysreflexia, right? Um, it's an inability of the sympathetic nervous system to uh, respond. I'm sorry, inability of the parasympathetic nervous system to respond to the sympathetic nervous system. They balance each other out. They're, they reflex on each other. If one is working, um, then the other one has to call. On that one down, you know, one increase, balance each other out. But uh, with this, um, patients have these symptoms. So um, I'll talk about what we're going to do for autonomic dysreflexia. The main thing is emptying the bladder and usually putting them in a sitting position, a seated position. Um, lumbar spine injuries. Uh, it could be partial or complete. Um, they can have paralysis of the lower extremities um, and loss of bowel bladder function and sexual function. So in the acute injury, the patient initially has a spinal cord injury. We're going to immobilize them. If a patient is found down and unconscious and we don't know how they got like that, we're going to immobilize them. Patient with acute head injury, we're going to immobilize them because if we don't know if they've or, uh, injured their spinal cord, we need to protect them from further disability. Remember, airway, breathing, circulation, and then after that comes D, disability. So not only that, but uh, immobilizing the C-spine is also protecting the airway. So when we immobilize the spine, we use a spinal board and a cervical collar, and it must remain immobilized until we determine the severity and location of injury. We need to rule out a C-spine injury before we remove a cervical collar. Um, in the event of a cervical uh, uh, fracture, um, we could use cervical traction. Cervical traction would only be used for uh, compression or deformities, compression of the C-spine uh, or deformity, um, but this is not going to be used um, if we've completely severed the uh, spinal cord. Um, they have a halo vest with halo traction. They also have this other um, form of traction, which is Gardner Wells tongs with these weights. Um, either way, when we use them, if we're doing the halo vest, that's usually worn for like three months, just like a cast. Um, and that is performed by, they're actually screwing this halo um, device into the skull. So these are gonna, there's gonna be pins in this site. Um, and if the patient has the Gardner Wells tongs, you do not remove weights. That is ordered by a doctor when a patient's in traction, when to remove weights. Um, and the only time you would need to do that is if this patient, if it was a life-threatening emergency, obviously, if they had signs of increasing intracranial pressure or something like that, and you needed to elevate the head of bed or whatever. We need to intubate, whatever the case may be. Um, only in life-threatening emergencies. Um, uh, anyway, assessing the skin is important under this vest, under the halo. Um, they have those screws into the skull. So of course, that's gonna put them at risk for infection traveling in to the brain. So. We need to keep those pins clean and dry at all times. Clean and dry at all times. We don't want to promote moisture around there. We don't need to wrap them up really. Um, we just uh, clean them. Um, sometimes it depends on the order of the doctor, multiple, probably at least twice or three times a day, you're cleaning it um, and leaving it open to air so it could be dry. Um, 
you do not turn the pins or screws, you advise the patient not to do so. Um, monitor for skin breakdown underneath the vest. They don't need to apply powder underneath the vest that puts you at risk for um, skin breakdown. Surgical management of uh, spinal cord injury um, could be a spinal fusion where they fuse the bones together. Um, that uh, could be used to stabilize uh, fractures, things like that. Um, laminectomy is where a part of the vertebrae is removed to alleviate pressure or compression. It relieves severe pain. A discectomy is complete um, removal of a herniated disc. Um, they also have now these artificial disc replacements. What you need to know is you need to monitor airway breathing circulation. You need to monitor the neurological status frequently. Monitor um, sensation, movement. Um, make sure they're not getting worse. Um, Assess and prevent infection of the incision site. Maintain skin integrity. Again, um, if they're not able to move around in the bed, they're going to be at high risk for skin breakdown. So you want to protect their skin and, of course, pain management. So complications, um, like I said before, autonomic dysreflexia. So what can I do as a nurse? One. Place the patient in high fowlers or a seated upright position to help um, decrease uh, blood pressure and intracranial pressure. Um, also, uh, remove causative stimuli. For example, straight catheterize the patient and uh, empty the bladder. If they have fecal impaction, which can cause this same thing, they may require you to digitally remove that impaction, whatever the case may be. Um, so that means um, treatment also is going to include getting them on a bowel program, uh, um, getting them on meds to prevent constipation, okay? Um, and I'll talk more about that in a minute. Respiratory compromise, again, um, C-spine injuries especially, um, they're going to have problems with breathing. Uh, this here, these pictures, I just put up here. Um, this was actually a patient of mine. It's not a violation of HIPAA because he was a very famous patient. Um, this, His name was Rasul Clark. Um, his nickname was Rocky. He was a fame, uh, a high school football player who was thought he was, you know, one of the top football players in the Chicago area at that time. He was a great in his high school years and was thought to be headed towards the NFL. However, in a, a high school football game at the age of 16, he uh, suffered a C-spine injury. Um, at the age of 27, he died due to the respiratory complications associated with that injury. Um, I knew him as a patient because he was what we call a frequent flyer. Um, he had numerous admissions throughout my nursing career at the hospital um, for respiratory compromise, pneumonia, um, because of those weak muscles. Uh, you could look him up. So it's not a violation of HIPAA. Um, he was, this was a famous story um, because um, he was so young and he was expected to, you know, go on and do great things. Um, the Chicago Bears built his family a house. Um, they won millions of dollar lawsuits against the school. Um, it was a big deal. But anyway, uh, respiratory compromise is a big thing. Um, these patients may require that chest physiotherapy to help break up secretions. They're going to be at risk for, um, for uh, pneumonia. And in the acute injury phase, you're probably going to be preparing for intubation and me um, mechanical ventilation. Uh, spinal shock. Spinal shock occurs in the acute injury. Um, it causes uh, 
a loss of sensation and flaccid paralysis below the level of injury. Um, it also causes uh, basal because of that inflammation of his spinal cord injury. They're going to have vasodilation at the area of injury and below. So that's going to cause hypotension, bradycardia. Spinal shock is due to an inflammatory response and hopefully should resolve as the injury improves unless they have a complete severing of the um, nerves. There's also neurogenic shock. Neurogenic shock is one of those major forms of shock that you'll be talking about next semester, but it is the nervous system, the sympathetic nervous system inability to communicate blood vessels, therefore cannot control and um, produce vasoconstriction in this case, um, or uh, increased heart rate. So in this case, um, administration of vasopressors or atropine, um, the same general treatment of shock, basically, which you will talk about more in nursing three. Orthostatic hypotension. Um, so with that, you want to reposition patients slowly. Um, applying thigh-high compression stockings will help promote blood flow back to the brain. Um, and then impaired skin integrity. I mean, you talked about this in nursing one. Protect the bony prominences. Uh, turn and reposition patients frequently. Um, the heels on pillows. Uh, provide a relief of pressure. However you do that, putting pillows underneath them or turning them from side to side. Um, bowel and bladder management, it, um, because of the uh, injury to the spinal cord, um, patients can end up with what's called neurogenic bladder or neurogenic bowel dysfunction. A uh, neurogenic bladder can be spastic where they're having random uh, spasms of the um, bladder and hyperactive bladder, or it could be flaccid um, where their bladder can't contract at all. So spastic, they may be able to go to the bathroom sometimes by themselves on their own, um, and sometimes they need to catheterize themselves. But people with a completely flaccid bladder um, typically need to self-cath um, and get on a schedule with that. Um, at night, patients could use a condom catheter or, I mean, if they wanted to use that all the time. Crudet's method is uh, applying pressure to the bladder to manually express urine. Um, for a neurogenic bowel, like I said before, these patients need to be on stool softeners, laxatives, may give them a suppository every other day, may even need to provide digital stimulation, and that is actually stimulating the rectum with a gloved and lubricated finger um, to get uh, to stimulate a bowel movement. Um, however, this can also uh, stimulate that vagal response um, and cause bradycardia and um, syncope. Um, so uh, development of the schedule is critical, uh, again, because we want to, one, uh, prevent fluid and electrolyte imbalance, but also to prevent autonomic dysreflexia. And that is neurological disorders.